I have started the recording, sir. Yeah. A warm good evening, all, with the blessings of our beloved founder, Chancellor Colonel Dr. J. P. S. Sir. I am happy to welcome you all for the second day. On behalf of Center for Ocean Research, we sincerely express our deepest thankfulness to our Honorable Chancellor, Ma'am, Dr. Maria Zina Johnson, and our President, Sir, Dr. Mary Johnson, for their constant guidance, support, and encouragement in all our activities. And I welcome our Director, Research, Ma'am, V. Sheila Rani, Ma'am, and our Head, Dr. D. Imbagandan, Sir, and our today's guest speaker, Dr. Grinson, Sir. So we can enter into the technical session now. The small intro of our guest speaker, Dr. Grinson. Dr. Grinson is principal scientist at Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute, Kochi, since 2018, and is presently on deputation as senior program specialist fisheries, Sark Agriculture Center, Dhaka. Previously, he worked as scientist for seven years at Central Island Agriculture Research Institute, Port Blair, with additional responsibilities as honorary coordinator, CPR Environmental Foundation, and Juliet Massey, honorary fellow of World Aquaculture Society. Dr. Grinson taught fishery science for one academic year, 2003, in the Republic of Maldives. Dr. Grinson is recipient of Dr. Rajendra Prasad Puraskar National Award in 2010 for the best book in agriculture and allied sectors by ICAR. He was awarded Dr. Hiralal Chowdhury Prize and Dr. Kulkarni Award at CIFE Mumbai for his research accomplishment. He is a recipient of merit fellowships for graduate, postgraduate, and doctoral programs. There are 15 best paper and poster awards to his credit in various conferences and symposiums. He received academic grants of more than 50 million, 50 million as a research grants from all major national funding agencies. He served as a member of Board of Studies in Environmental Science of Kufus Kerala. On his expertise and global appreciation of works, he was provided six foreign travel grants by various global funding agencies to visit United Kingdom, China, Thailand, Italy, France, and Australia. He has published more than 130 articles with 52 peer-reviewed high-impact fact research job papers, six books, three edited books, 15 book chapters, and more than 100 conference abstracts. I welcome you once again, sir. Now the session is over to you. Thank you for the nice words, Anu, and thanks for the opportunity, Imbagadan, sir, and uh, the team management of uh, Satyabama. So I'll share my screen. Yes, sir. Things are fine now. Yes, sir. Yes, fine, sir. I think the volume is slightly less. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay, let's start. Thanks for the nice words. Uh, it's all part of scientific career, like anyone who is a scientist and reach this level, they will have all these accomplishments and it's not a big, big thing with me also. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. So, uh, so today we'll be discussing much on the prospects of technological interventions and uh, I am not an expert in technological interventions, though I work on climate change, but since the topic is uh, given this way, I will try to orient the talk on technological interventions and I will speak on the interventions which can be possible for adaptation and I am not telling much about mitigation except for one mangrove reforestation. Some countries are really into mitigation activities, for example in SARC, uh, Bhutan is doing it. I presently work on uh, SARC platform, as you know it's South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. It has it established regional centers at uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh and that was for agriculture. Initially, it started as an agricultural information hub. Now we have senior program specialists just like me working in fisheries and aquaculture. There are people from livestock, there are people from crop sciences, horticulture, natural resource management. And uh, we, we do have a, a and we do have some uh, specialists from economics also. And technical team to support it, administrative team to support it, and it is 
placed in the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Council. Just like in India, we have Indian Council of Agricultural Research. We have Bangladesh Agricultural Research Council. And uh, SARC Agriculture Center is located in Bangladesh Agricultural Research Council headquarters. We have programs uh, which is spanning across all eight nations. You can see the country flags here. In all my presentations, all these country flags will be there. So coming to the topic, let us uh, straight away jump like, uh, probably with uh, Dr. Vivekanandan's lecture yesterday, you may be quite sure that there is climate shift, but there are a lot of people in the world thinking that we don't have a proper climate shift. These are all uh, regional or local mechanisms. I want to ascertain the point that there is climate shift. And this is one classic slide of the, classic slide of the polar bear, which is shown by most of the climate scientist to show that there is climate shift. But these pictures won't speak the truth. We have to look into scientific data and say that there is a climate shift. So let us look whether we can tell something really on climate shift. Uh, in case if I am audible, kindly intervene. So, audible, sir, no problem. Okay, and uh, we have the Pliocene epoch. People say geological time scale where uh, some of the Scientists tell that in the geological time scale, if we look into the weather pattern, if you look into the climate change related exercises, we say that sometimes with the time and the temperature, uh, within the three to five million years span, there has been similar temperature change regimes in the geological time scale. At some time, the temperature was as high as what we are having now. And subsequently, the temperature has come down and there was cooling. So we have in between a warm geological time scales and cold geological time scales and probably now we are living in warmer time scales that is one argument put forth by geological scientists uh, and they say that even the gases but if you look closely to the gas composition okay carbon dioxide level uh, as similar to the same conditions now what we are facing previously also the globe has come to somewhat similar levels but we are slightly on the higher scale but if we look into the methane emissions, it is thrice unlike previous geological observations. Thrice, three times the methane emissions are high. Do that has got something to do with climate change. We will look into the slides coming. So with this, the major impact what people are saying is the temperature rise. And with the temperature rise, the basic problem the people are facing is because of the sea level which is increasing and inundating. I am basically coming from Cochin. Cochin is very close to the sea and the mean sea level is increasing and we are facing the music. Earlier in my bio biodata people, uh, she read that, and we read that I worked in Maldives. And Maldives already, there are islands which have been uh, let free or the people who are staying in the islands, they have gone from this those islands because the islands are sinking. The, those phenomena is available in India also. We have some islands even in and around Cochin also which are sinking. Uh, there is an island in which only one person is staying because the rest all the people fled away from the island because the island is constantly facing the music of sea level rise. So mostly the small island nations. We have also small island nations uh, in our country. Uh, Maldives is in, in our uh, region, South Asian region. Maldives is one among that and Sri Lanka is also a small island nation. And we have our archipelago of uh, Adam and Nicobar group of islands where I worked for seven years. Those are also similar to small island nation, but since it's a union territory, which is part of India, we don't call it as an island. Uh, it's a union territory, but it's an island ar archipelago. Lakadiv Islands also, uh, island archipelago, it's an atoll. So all these small islands, they are facing the music because they are low-lying areas and they are vulnerable and facing the threats of sea level rise. So initially, we thought of this process as something which is... Uh, uh, taking from our own houses like uh, we think that we are safe in our houses so we think that our houses uh, near the hills and uh, hilltops and if something is happening the, it won't reach the rivers or even if it is reaching the rivers it goes to the sea there is no problem let the, let the sea or ocean face it but now the ocean is giving back to us because the activities which we are doing in our houses it is taken to the hills and the hills are taking it to the rivers and the rivers are taking it to the ocean and ocean is definitely giving back to us. There is some uh, natural justice we see. So do we have a climate crisis really? Again, I have to explain with scientific data. So I told that methane is increasing three times more than 
what we ever recorded in the geological time scale and it is very dangerous because it is 20 times potentially warming greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide even though carbon dioxide is increasing and everybody is not knowing about carbon dioxide which is a silent killer uh, it is mostly the among the greenhouse gas emissions 76 percent is contributed by it and 16 percent by methane and six percent by nitrous oxide can we revert this scenario uh, one typical example is the lockdown regulations people are saying but uh, there is no no big change except for the lockdown period again things are coming back to normal when the lockdowns were relaxed or regulations were moved out uh, but whether we can do something about it this is the talk which we have been listening so far but there are very interesting examples uh, with respect to the chlorofluorocarbons chlorofluorocarbons which is also a greenhouse gas but its share is much much less but it was creating problem to the ozone so towards the end of 80s you probably know about the uh, protection measures started with ozone and uh, we could see like uh, because of the agreements we could considerably contribute uh, in reducing the chlorofluorocarbons so same way if uh, there are a lot of global efforts ipcc is trying its level best to come uh, with awareness programs with treaties bilateral trilateral multilateral treaties and uh, UNS uh, enforce, trying to enforce all those thing, uh, these things through different agreements and uh, we are trying to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions but how can we do it so in general when greenhouse gas is increasing we all know that greenhouse gas is very much important because the heat trapped is uh, important for keeping the earth warm but if it is more it will trap more heat so if more heat is trapped what is happening you know that a simple uh, tumbler if you are keeping water and boiling it the water will slowly expand as the water uh, the temperature starts increasing the water will slowly expand this is because as the water warms the molecules move and interact more causing the water to take up more space so more space means more volume and more volume means it has to go somewhere the ocean itself is not sufficient so it will encroach the land area it's increasing the volume required is more so that is known as thermal expansion so along with the thermal expansion we have the extra heat which is causing melting of ice sheets glaciers and all those things and really these are all impacts of climate and uh, it's very evident like greenland uh, losing so many million tons and Antarctica losing so many million tons and alaska losing so many million tons so these are the reports which we are regularly seeing and definitely the trend is an increasing trend there has not been any reversing signals in case of temperature from 1970s onwards it's always increasing so when it is increasing just like the mercury which is going up mercury is also liquid when the temperature is more there is an expansion and mercury is going up similar way when the temperature is going up water is also expanding the volume liquid is much high and it is creating sea level rise and other related problems and all this is because of the increase in the composition of greenhouse gases which are mostly anthropogenic in nature because humans are creating it after the industrial revolution there is a sudden spurt in these gases probably dr vivekananda might, might explain much about it so i am not going into those details so with this we have a big problem of uh, ocean current dysfunction when ocean current dysfunction happens there is going to be problems within the ocean it reacts back there are a lot of uh, resulting things. It is the cold and warm currents in the ocean which keeps it, keeps the entire ecosystem in a stable stable condition. So when these things are not really happening, there are changes happening in ocean currents. It really upsets the rhythm, and there are a lot of havocs caused by it. One major way of ocean reacting to it is in the form of cyclones, because when temperature is trapped much, it leads to thermal stratification and uh, because of the thermal stratification, the, a lot of inherent energy is existing there and this has to be bro broken away. And the resultant, resulting mechanism is cyclone which moves, which uh, comes out with a lot of energy outside, spurting out a lot of energy and creates a lot of problem for the people as well as the organisms existing inside. So definitely as I as I am telling, there is a great climate shift. So initially if you look into the geological time scale, it is the carbon dioxide which is having ups and downs and now we are slightly above the most high, heavily recorded carbon dioxide ppm concentrations so far and uh, these are the geological time scales and you can see like now the median level in the present scenario it is much much higher three times higher than ever the world has recorded ever the globe has recorded based on the geological time scale findings 
So if methane is more in the ocean, people say that methane hydride is very good because it acts as a fossil fuel reserve. Uh, and uh, like natural gas, oil, coal, we have gas hydrates in the form of methane. And if we can explore it, it can be a fossil fuel also. But are there any problems? The real problem is like the extraction of methane hydride is not an easy job, unlike uh, other natural gases and uh, uh, the, uh, the petroleum products which we are extracting. So the methane emission, when, just, when, when it is increasing, it is showing some signals in the ocean. The signal is in the form of fish kills because of the excessive emissions of methane hydrates, which is coming from the substrate and creating a war. So climate change is certain. It is increasing the intensity of precipitation. Even people who are from Chennai, uh, they might have seen the floods happening. Chennai is not so uh, known for the uh, rainfalls which is happening. Uh, much. Our rainfall in the intensity has changed a lot in the recent years. The total amount of rainfall is the same, but the intensity with which the rainfall is coming to the earth, it also has changed a lot. So there is no change in the total rainfall, but there are less rainy days, and when there is rain, it pours, it really pours. A lot of rain is coming, and it's creating a lot of problems. There are sediments and nutrients which are leaching. There are coastal flooding which is happening. Along with the mean sea level, if you imagine the flood is also coming, you, you must have seen like when really the floods happened in Chennai, what was the situation. So same way, uh, when carbon dioxide is increasing, it is creating a lot of problems to the wetlands and uh, ocean acidification is happening. When ocean acidification is happening, there are a lot of organisms, both vertebrates and invertebrates, which are really depending upon the alkaline pH of oceans. Ocean is alkaline in nature. So this increased alkaline pH is helping them to survive in the ocean conditions. So if it is becoming acidified, you can imagine it's a big threat for them. Sea surface temperature, as I told, it is increasing with the increase in greenhouse gas. And this heating is not uh, on an average uniform everywhere. It is different in different places. And the worst to suffer is our Indian Ocean, particularly the Northern Indian Ocean. So, because of that, we have frequent uh, cyclones happening here, a lot of frequent algal blooms. Sometimes these algal blooms are not useful to us. Most of them are harmful algal blooms. We have serious episodes of coral bleaching happening. So, we are trying to look into how the temperature is happening, uh, temperature budget is upset, and how the temperature is coming to the northern Indian Ocean. All those issues we are dealing in the coming slides. And because of this, all these temperature increases, we have sea level rise, as I told, and coastal erosion, inundation, all these things are happening. Wind is changing, the coastal circulations are changing, and it all reacts in a very bad form, creating a lot of problems for the ocean ecosystem. Now, really, how the climate is affecting the ecosystems. This uh, article was published as a cover page of Current Science uh, in 2011, January, the first uh, edition of Current Science in 2011. This was a cover page article. So coral bleaching happened in Andaman Islands. Basically, that time we could say that it was the increase in sea surface temperature. But the phenomena was not explained. Why the temperature is increasing? Is it just uh, the increasing trends of climate? If it is an increasing trend of climate change, every year we should have bleaching. But every year we are not having bleaching. So this has to do with something with the phenomena like El Nino. We, we, mentioned that it may be because of El Nino, because El Nino happened in 1990, we had a terrible bleaching. 2002, we had terrible bleaching. 2005, we had mild bleaching. 2010, we had a serious bleaching, 15. But luckily, the ENSO periods which happened in 17 and 18, there was not that serious effects. Uh, either it was not so observed very clearly or probably, I don't know. There are a lot of mechanisms, but it was not so heavily reported. But again, bleaching is happening in all these years when ENSO is very strong. And you can see like when bleaching is happening, it is really affecting the fauna and flora. Uh, the type of uh, corals before bleaching and after bleaching, it's different. And the bleached corals, though they look like uh, snow, some people feel like this snowy feeling, it looks good, but it's really terrible for the corals. This is because of the temperature increase and the polyps moving out and only exoskeleton remains. Along with the bleaching, if there is cyclone also happening, I told thermal stratification is creating a lot of problems and this energy which is accumulated in the form of the uh, heat, it is given out in the form of cyclones. When cyclone happens, they exert a lot of pressure on the corals. And sometimes you can see massive corals are getting upturned. And uh, if bleaching is happening, this happened in 2011. In 2010, there was massive bleaching. And after the bleaching, uh, 
the next ecological succession is like the algae coming and smothering all these uh, corals when algae is covering or smothering the corals then the polyps won't come back and all bleached corals will die off so when uh, additional to the bleaching there is a pressure or physical forcing exerted by the winds that creates some sort of eddies and when the coastal eddies are formed very close to the reef environment they damage the coral reefs there are a lot of pressure exerted by this cyclones on the reefs also and it, it is also damaging so in addition there is a synergistic effect of temperature plus the uh, eddies caused by cyclones which is creating a lot of problems for the corals so if the ecosystem is affected definitely the heat of global warming is affecting the fishes also we will look closely how it is basically the entire ecosystem is controlled by the primary producers so here is the picture of a, the primary producers producing their pigments this is chlorophyll chlorophyll is basically a biological pigment because it will happen only in in the plants live plants they will have the chlorophyll pigment but now you can see the more number of physicists are working on this it is it has now become a geophysical data because there are sensors which can measure the color and the color of this sensors uh, they have been utilized by the satellite remote sensing and with the help of satellite remote sensing sensors we could capture the change in the dynamics of this chlorophyll pigment and it has just become a geophysical data like situation so there are n number of satellites having sensors to measure the color of the water body color of the terrestrial land and all those things there are specific sensors there are ocean satellites also there are land satellites also so all these satellites are measuring the color of the ocean as well as the land so if there are satellite sensors measuring this color we can definitely know what is the abundance of the organism contributing to that color so based on the abundance of chlorophyll we can assume that how much is the plant body present in those areas you can see the seasonal change from january to december in every year how it is changing during summer the land area is becoming barren or brown because the leaves are going away winter also the leaves are going away so the green color is not the not the but our interest is basically in the ocean flora because the ocean flora is also changing a lot because of this uh, change in season change in dynamics and change in climate also so since climate is having a big role in changing the ocean dynamics of phytoplankton now there is an initiative known as ocean color climate change initiative it is started by european space agency and the lead person is dr shubha satyendranam she is my principal collaborator at pilmod marine laboratory earlier was lead professor Trevor Platt, with whom I started working, and someone has okay. Uh, it was late, Professor Trevor Platt, of course, with whom I started working on this ocean color, and we could make much progress, and this is still alive. Why it is very important with respect to the fishes? Sometimes the life cycle in the fishes, like they are very much related to the. ocean color or the phytoplankton present for example the most common species sardine which is available in our waters sardine utilizes the bloom period from may to september may to september generally we have a diatomaceous bloom diatoms uh, are formed because of the presence of silica plus other nutrients which are coming because of upwelling in the region so when uh, subsurface nutrient rich waters are coming along with the southwest monsoon and the added nutrients coming from the rivers because monsoon will bring a lot of water from the terrestrial sources along with the water there will be silica the water will be turbid it is brown in color so it is bringing in a lot of nutrients and it is creating a diatomaceous bloom and this bloom is utilized by the indian oil sardine so from may to september it is the physiological active period but prior to that there can be harmful blooms like trichodesmia or after this also there can be harmful blooms like uh, uh, dinoflagellates so if a trichodesmium bloom is intruding into the upwelling diatomaceous bloom period or the dinoflagellate blooms are intruding into the uh, diatomaceous bloom period this is not good for sardines so if we can clearly see these changes this is one way we can tell or there are some mismatches of the real physiological time period or life cycle of sardine we can tell that that particular year sardine production is going to be bad and this is having a big role by satellite uh, when we look into the satellite uh, sea surface temperature also it is having a big role because uh, 
when uh, el nino is happening the enso is affecting the uh, northern indian ocean region and because of the change in the uh, walker circulation which is an atmospheric circulation el nino is happening in the uh, latin american countries peru and chile coast and the temperature budget is upset and this excess temperature is pumped through a circulation or atmospheric circulation called walker circulation it's a bridging mechanism what is happening there in the south pacific is transferred through an atmospheric circulation and it is coming and dumped in the indian ocean this this happens with a lag period there it is happening in the december and the excess temperature is pumped after a lag of nearly 4 to 6 months so after 4 to 6 months means it is april may june period we already have summer here we have excess temperature here in addition if some more heat is being pumped here it is clearly upsetting us and and so plus the summer is creating a havoc and that's why more temperature is being pumped in i was telling that that is the clear mechanism we could later find that mechanism and could publish that is also attributing to the coral reef ecosystem damage and it's creating problem for the fishes also now with these changes these imbalances when we there is a lot of catalog cataloging happening with respect to the harmful algal bloom incidents also in the northern indian ocean region there are secondary data sources which are clearly indicating that from 1908 to 2015 it has increased in our abc much much strongly and we have a catalog data from 1935 to 2019 in bay of bengal also so in our abc the harmful algal bloom occurrences it has increased approximately three times three fold increase in have events has happened during the last two decades compared to the first two decades in the bay of bengal approximately two fold increase has happened in the last two decades compared to the first two decades so these are the types of increase in frequency of harmful algal bloom events happening in our arabian sea and bay of bengal region also so the global primary production in general and in particular to the northern indian ocean we have a lot of problems and clearly the studies have indicated that in the long term and the presently also the global the primary production what is happening in our northern indian ocean is coming less and less if primary production is less definitely it's going to affect the secondary and tertiary and thus the fishes also so as a study i was telling about the ocean color climate change initiative uh, ocean color is used so ocean color can be different it can be as green as this it can be blue it can be turbid as this when during monsoon the coastal waters are very much turbid so so as to study the coastal waters we should have the wide spectral reflectance so the green the spectral reflectance is different along with the green water you can see the spectral reflectance shown here uh, uh, it's different and the turbid water it is still complex so we have the difference in spectra which can be captured by the satellite remote sensing and we can make ternary plots basically this color is contributed by the phytoplankton the turbidity or total suspended materials that sometimes colored in dissolved organic matter so uh, a simple equipment called uh, sicky disk when we study climate scientists are finding dearth of data to really study the climate so they employ different mechanism to find data and now with the research fundings coming to a standstill or probably uh, there is squeezing of lot of research funds all the organizations globally they are suffering because research funding is not as good as before so scientists are also looking into mechanism in which we are, we should have some time series mechanisms one way is like enabling uh, sensors another way is like using resources or societal resources like uh, human or the people to generate scientific data so one such mechanism is known as citizen science where the people who are involved in a particular area their inputs can be used so we have used this small equipment known as mini secchi disk this is most of you are familiar with secchi disk this is used to you can see the color from blue to yellow to orange to brown in the secchi disk this is a color embedded this is a code it is the code is from 1 to 21 each color is indicated by a code and this code represents the color of the water so anybody who is having this simple equipment which is a 3d print printed uh, secchi disk so this is a 3d printed secchi disk on which this color code is embedded so if we can have this you can easily measure the secchi depth and you can give the color code so as to transfer the data now everybody is having mobile most of the people are having mobile and if you have this app tarbaka this is available in the google play store this was developed by me and uh, the sim for it team so this app tarbaka app is available in the google play store our stakeholders are uh, uh installing this application and they are sending us the secchi depth and the data 
this data will help us to know the type of color the water is having and from the color of the water the turbidity and from the turbidity and the color and the nature of the turbidity the manual is available in the cmfri website this presentation pdf i have already shared there and it can be circulated among the team who have registered and who are participating you can have this you can download this manual it is free you can see like how it is working so this is the different mechanism in which the app application is working a lot of people stakeholders are involved in, in at this citizen science people they are involved in this the advantage is like as a scientist if i have to travel lot of distance to do measurement if i give this small equipment to the person locally he can spend 5 minutes or 10 minutes and send us the data so long time series and extended area of observations can happen if we extend this on a global scale it can have global observations so this is a less expensive mean is of getting some time series data which will be useful if we can put we cannot have much progress to be made and in same apparently we are using such data to see like how the fishes are behaving also so from such data sets we are trying to see the program is known as chlorips and it is led by dr jay shankar j j shankar in my in the in the same division where i am working we are trying to see like how this data can be evolved to the level of the fishes and help us so i was telling about the events what is happening in the north indian ocean so because of the excess temperature which is pumped because of oceanographic events el nino it is bringing in more more heat towards the indian northern indian ocean region and it pumps in more heat during summer season and it, you can see the picture which clearly indicates that the red color indicates the anomalous ex, uh, temperature changes what happens in those pixels than the average things a green a yellow greenish color is indicating similar color but red is indicating the anomalous changes happening in the temperature so such temperature changes happen in northern indian ocean during el nino it is known as enso and exactly opposite during la nina so la nina phase is comparatively okay for the fishes and organisms so la nina phase there is an increase of uh, uh, our fishes like sardines and mostly these are affecting pelagic fishes because all these are surface related phenomena when pelagics are affected automatically there will be a small cascading effect to the predators already the uh, higher higher predators already there are issues of over exploitation of the fishes happening with the additional problems created by climate change again we have problems with the uh, spawning stock biomass poor feeding conditions for the fishes distribution rates and the abundance particularly with respect to sardine and we have come up with the model and we are giving predictions also on regular basis so you can see like in 2015 lot of red pixels a lot, lot of excess heating happened there but in 2016 it's not much but 15 it was an el nino year so enso was more more prominent so such problems are happening and this is creating lot of problems dr vivekanandan might have told about the spread of the fishes like latitudinal spread of the fishes changing in spawning season all physiological problems like musculoskeletal abnormalities uh, changes in catch and related problems coral bleaching which we have discussed all those problems are happening in aquaculture people generally say that with the mean sea level increasing probably the brackish water aquaculture is having more scope because inundated inundated areas can be good for culture activities but this is a very short term relief because when the temperature are in, temperature is increasing there can be a spurt in the production also because the metabolic activities uh, um, in, initially it is supporting the fish fish but on the later scale it is also going to be very detrimental so it is going to be vulnerable when the temperature is going to increase to the higher levels that is what siba has told they have done some experiments these are the slides of dr murlidhar from siba so we worked together for a paper uh, on climate change initially prior to my joining in sarp we have made a country status paper for india so that time he shared these slides so what is the future that concerns there are a lot of imminent challenges which we have discussed there is a vulnerability for fisheries and aquaculture and specifically there are some problems and the future is not going to be very smooth we have unexpected disease outbreaks even people say that covid is also having some relation to the tem temperature or the climate change related effects and there are unknown diseases which are uh, unheard before occurring now in a massive scale environmental degradation is having this is a figure which i have placed in the uh, open source publications it, it's in our website that website is also i have shared in one of the slides there is a policy brief there you can see into this this figure is given there so there are a lot of impacts on the environment this environment is impacting the resource 
and this resource crunch is affecting the resource users probably dr shyam sarin tomorrow will be explaining much on the resource users when resource users are affected the society is affected and it's creating a big problem so we are trying to foresee what is happening in the future we have made forecasting of variables in 2030 2050 and 2080 and things are not good like even uh, the chlorophyll is coming down means the food production is coming down and this will have a cascading effects on high end predators ocean acidification also no solis if the uh, it is an in different scenarios uh, we have research concentration pathways when climate scientists studies they study that if the usual scenario is if things are going how it is if it is improving how it is if it is highly improving how it is in all the scenarios we find that ocean acidification it is increasing and the ph is going to be going to come down and ph if it is coming down it is going to affect the organisms so vulnerability forecasting is not showing much hope we have developed models to incorporate these environmental variables and see like how the biomass is going to get affected and uh, things are not so good these are some predictions made for sardine and sardine is also seriously affected so finally coming to the main areas if these are the available information with us do we have some strategies first thing is like we should know really how much vulnerable our resources are if we know the vulnerability of the resources we should have some mechanism to uh, have some adaptation strategies for example if it is affecting a certain group of fishes or a certain zones of uh, the country we have to see like the society or the fishermen involved should be moving from those zones probably dr shyam will be dealing with uh, all those things in detail tomorrow but all these vulnerabilities are based on the environmental biological criteria dr vivekananda might have explained also yesterday so we should have some adaptation with uh, strategies so basically it is the variables which are getting uh, affected because of the influence of changes in the environmental variables there are a lot of vulnerabilities to the ecosystem to the organisms to the chemical physical and biological nature of the system and adaptation strategies like habitat mapping like we should know like how much a particular uh, advantages or essential fish habitats or essential habitats are there for example essential habitats means mangroves corals or other similar habitats we should have a proper mapping monitoring and management coastal wetlands which are very good source of and important for scientific fish farming also such wetlands have to be monitored i told about the vulnerability vulnerability assessment we have to reduce the mechanisms like uh, the fishermen in in fisheries per se there are a lot of uh, uh, carbon footprint involved and india is comparatively doing better so we should have mechanisms in which we can reduce the carbon footprint potential fishing zone advisories is one such mechanism because the fishermen cannot spend much time in scouting rather they can go into the sea reduce their time for scouting and catch the fish and come back Uh, seaweed farming where carbon sequestration can be a mechanism harvesting alternate fuel or energy sources going for multi vendor uh, e-commerce solutions if fish is coming and the resource is getting better priced the uh, resource will be better utilized and people will go for less less quantity if they are getting better price they will come for even they will they will be ready to compromise for less catch also so we have to go for such mechanisms which are climate resilient resilient and we are basically thinking of climate resilient coastal villages so one mechanism is a mitigation mechanism like those which are uh, carbon sequestrating ecosystem for example in our case mangroves you are probably aware in uh, cas dr kadreshan has developed a uh, mangrove forest with his own efforts and in kerala we had uh, hookodri is no more uh, but he he was a a uh, very normal uh, not a big academic or something like that he was a very normal person working in those areas of uh, malabar northern part of kerala he was so much involved in mangrove restoration mechanism he is not as the mango man so like a lot of efforts are going and different states have got inspired and uh, dr velvedi is also talking mssrf has also taken up some mechanisms so i am not telling much on the risk restoration mechanism this is one major inputs done uh, by Uh, Dr. Joe of Sea Mafara River. He is trying to develop some good habitats for the fishes or ecosystem restoration using artificial reefs. Artificial reefs are uh, refuges for fishes, and if artificial reefs are employed, it will reduce the trawl related fishing activities, and at the same time, it acts as an area where a lot of fishes can conglomerate, and it will 
we will add to the biodiversity and related mechanisms. So this is one mechanism in which we can um, intervene. Artificial reefs and CFR is doing much. And another thing is integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. Integrated multi-trophic aquaculture is a culture technique in which we are trying to utilize seaweeds also into the aqua farming. Along with cage mariculture activities, we can have seaweed farming also. This is a small video generated by our Mandavam research team, Dr. Jay Gumar and his team. They have really, not only them, but other seafarers uh, centers also really promoted integrated multitrophic aquaculture. So Dr. Jay Gumar and Johnson made this video. Along with the mariculture activities, if we can go for seaweed farming, that will take the metabolic waste and a lot of carbon sequestration also will happen. So this is a climate resilient technology. So that we can have increased production of fish, increased production of seaweed, both will add to the profit and that is adding to the carbon credits also. So when there is a profit, people will be interested in taking up the technology. So this is one mechanism in which marine scientists can contribute as a resilient climate technology. You can see the type of carbon credits we are adding because we are having good production of uh, seaweeds in the rafts. The farmers are adop adopting this technology. It's not only scientific, it has gone into the farm field and people are doing it. So it's a climate, climate resilient product which is coming from seaweed. So we can have seaweeds for different uh, um, product development also. Biochar is one such mechanism. And this can even be utilized. The seaweeds, if it's coming in excess, the waste of the seaweeds can be used for development of biochars. And biochar can be an addition for the pokali. Pokali is a saline resistant rice varieties. I'll be showing some slides in which this integration can happen. So when fish or shrimp farming is happening in the saline thing and the uh, uh, pokali farming is also happening. It's an integrated mechanism and in which a lot of carbon sequestration ha can happen. Such mechanisms have to be promoted. And when we are doing our own experiments, we should have an estimate of the greenhouse gas emission and the carbon footprint which is involved in it. So we, CIMAFARA has developed its own indigenous mechanism of measuring the greenhouse gas emissions and how we can continuously monitor them in the fields and uh, the, how the organisms are emitting. There are a uh, lot of uh, meso and microcosm experiments also done by different organizations. Even NAO has done many things in the sea also. So these are mechanisms in which we can monitor. We, if, we, if we can monitor, we can come up with some solutions also, how best we can change it. 
there is another mechanism of estimation known as life cycle assessment dr vivekananda also told it and uh, we should know really how much is the carbon footprint uh, what is happening and imta i have already explained with uh, the video presentation so these are some mechanisms and integrated systems were uh, rice uh, coconut beds or other uh, carbon sequestering mechanisms are utilized that will form a green technology it's a climate climate resilient technology now for a resilient village development or resilient societies we should use the maximum or best way of using the resources in the entire supply chain or value chain if we can reduce the uh, spillage of money to the middleman and if the real people who are producing it is getting the maximum then there will be more profit and there will be less depend dependence on the resources and it will be adding to the less resource crunch and better effective a uh, way of utilizing the resources in a climate scenario ecological resilience is very important and for that eco monitoring is an important mechanism i was telling about the wetlands and simple application has been developed by isro and anybody if they are downloading the application the person moving around the wetland can easily map it so if we are adding this mapped wetlands along with some other uh, information on a continuous scale some advisories can be given for example small wetlands small wetlands are ideal for a uh, aquaculture activities because it's not going to disturb the uh, biodiversity or other problems so small wetlands is ideal for uh, extensive fish or aquaculture related activities so if we can map small wetlands we can have some spatial mapping work some of the small wetlands can be uh, climate friendly utilized for aqua farming and related activities and sac and isro is doing some mechanism on mapping it i was telling about the methane hydrate so if methane hydrate if it's the methane emissions are creating a lot of problems uh, it is going to be a climate disaster but if methane hydrates can be properly harvested by pumping uh, either carbon in a chamber and bringing the methane out and utilizing it as a fossil fuel this can be a technology which can serve as an alternate energy source at the same time controlling the methane emissions so uh, people have come up with different ideas some people were telling like oceans are big sinks we can pump in lot of carbon but it's not so ocean is already a big sink it has lot of stored carbon in that if we are pumping in additional carbon to the ocean sometimes the ocean react violently and already the stored carbons which are there it can come out so we really don't know how the ocean is going to react but if we can extract what is existing there in a fruitful mechanism additional emissions can be avoided and there can be a future there are a lot of potential areas which have been mapped and uh, there are some gas hydrate recovered areas also there are some areas in red color which are indicating there are inferred presence of gas hydrates which can be easily taken and used as a fossil fuel also india is also doing a lot of experiments particularly in national institute of ocean energy so we should really go for uh, resilience related mechanisms and we can have some indicators for measurement of resilience so basically this is coming with respect to the stakeholders who are involved in climate change related activities particularly the fishermen the coastal villages who are involved because most uh, for example there are some uh, areas which can be uh, cvc is critically vulnerable coastal areas uh, for example vembanad vembanad the entire vembanad lake is a area where the people are really dependent on that but it has to be conserved also so we should be really knowing the vulnerability of such systems and the stakeholders should be playing a big role in a uh, in changing the situations themselves so the indicators are going to be very powerful tools and dr shyam may be explaining much about this there are simple technologies people are promoting uh, saying that it will be useful for climate for reducing the temperature emissions to the atmosphere for example people say that white reflects uh, heat in warmer areas like our countries in colder areas this may not be a solution but in warmer areas because they require some heat also but in warmer areas we don't we don't want heat in our house so our rooftops can be painted white it can reflect some people say that it's not going to be a large scale change but some people say that it uh, worldwide change of roof rooftop uh, rooftops into white color it can uh, it, it is equivalent to taking every car in the world off the road for 50 years that's a big thing so this is what concordia university says so different people have different version even this can generate some uh, employment also at the same time this can be very useful for your house you can paint your rooftop and you find that your electricity consumption uh, you are becoming more green when you are like because your house is comparatively cooler it is reflecting away the heat 
you will lose use less fan you will use less air conditioner so this is one mechanism what people say that it is going to be very good so the experiments also prove that it is uh, it is worthy enough this is not my findings i have taken from the literature so there are simple techniques another problem which is creating uh, issues to climate change is uh, the heavy traffic probably corona has uh, given us some relief and this is practiced much when uh, more people are traveling there is a lot of fuel consumption happening not only the fuel consumption fuel consumption and driving the car also is not the problem this fuel consumption generates a lot of carbon dioxide and it's a greenhouse gas and the temperature is increasing so when more carbon dioxide is there it creates some sort of problems a lot of disasters are happening cyclones are happening so uh, the lockdown has created a situation in which people are working from home working from home gives us a lot of uh, personal space also there can be better family and work balance you have to spend less time on traveling you can be in the confined situation in some organizations different definitely working from home has um, reduced the uh, uh, you know expenditure because they need not keep their office uh, establishment close where the people are working from home they need not travel so a lot of things improved by working from home and some people say that the productivity is also high you can work at leisurely from the place of your choice and the output is important not the place of work is important and the world is embracing such technology in a larger scale and definitely in the years to come not only uh, because of climate because of the pandemics like corona all prefer to work from home now and the productivity is not much affected but uh, some uh, some places when we go for lockdown or related regulations it may not be very feasible because any industrial output workers are required so such problems are creating economic problems but in some sectors this can be very useful for example it it already they the it companies are giving lot of leverages for working from home and such strategies will help us in improving this is a strategy recommended by the fishery section of uh, our organization south asian association for regional cooperation this policy brief can be downloaded we are telling that the root cause and vulnerability issues should be identified and we should have a network of labs which are which will give response to issues on climate and scale up the best practices which are compatible to climate we should find alternate energy sources which will reduce the carbon footprint in fisheries and aquaculture good saline temperature tolerant and fast growing species the, now the available time for growing the fish is also less so fast growing species are preferred after 6 months there can be serious drought okay so the organism should grow fast salinity is increasing temperature is increasing so saline resistant because i told about mean sea level rise saline water will be coming into the land area so such salinity temperature increases also have to be tolerated so such fast growing species to be bred and farmed seasonal aquaculture we should practice in perennial water bodies so this will help in uh, better uh, output farming of carbon sequestering species i told about seaweed imta and modern technologies like ras and all those th things can be practiced with priority to market access technology management and operating environment spatial mapping is a very important tool we should know in our country which all areas are having what all resources and what are the problems in this and we can have such spatial mapping which will reduce the conflicts we should uh, have the proper idea on the societal idea, societal intake on a particular uh, activity so spatial maps are going to national level spatial maps are going to resolve a lot of problems and lot of ecosystem restoration mechanisms such as done for mangroves reefs and others should be practiced so in general the take home message is like climate change is certain and scientific evidences indicate some key issues related to marine ecosystem this is manifested in different forms and uh, rather than mitigation we have to go for adaptation strategy in a big country like us with a national plan which we can really abide with and execute i told about some technologies which are resilient and we have some options for the people who are really affected like when the fisheries is affected because of climate change we should have a diversified livelihood option in the form of including fisheries in the form of a mariculture and uh, imta so that it is climate resilient at the same time providing a diversified livelihood option also such technologies can be a game changer and i told about citizen science initiative people should come forward in doing science so such citizen science initiatives are in long way going to help the climate scientists to tackle climate change related issues so we have to practice it joint hand in hand with science for data collection and support so this is not done alone lot of people are involved i have taken uh, 
uh, inputs from IIT and Roxy's presentation. I have taken support yes. from uh, my own colleagues in uh, different parts of the country. I work with Central Island Agriculture Research Institute. I work with the National Institute of Oceanography. I work with Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute. So, in a, during this, I have worked with several people, several inputs I have taken. It's a multidisciplinary subject. And the National Initiative on Climate Resilient Aquaculture, we have a major program called Comfort, in which we are addressing some of this uh, solution strategies. So, all Comfort is a fund, uh, the funding is basically from MOEs and uh, National Environmental. Uh, uh, Research Center of India, NERSI is also an associate partner. So all these people are involved in my studies. I thank all of them. And I particularly thank uh, Dr. Vagandan and uh, Anu for giving me this platform. Thanks for the patient listening. I am open for discussion. I will just stop sharing my slides. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the wonderful and informative presentation, sir. Actually, uh, our uh, advisor of uh, Sakebama Technology Business Incubator, Dr. Sheshantri, is available here. Uh, sir, uh, Sheshantri, sir, I would like to have some few words to you. Yeah, thank you so much for giving this wonderful opportunity, Dr. Grinson, to hear your uh, lecture. It was very nice, uh, informative, and uh, thought-provoking for most of the people to uh, get more insights into the happenings in the SAR countries. I have only, I have, I mean, one, only few questions. On this area, it's only good at a policy level or as you said in the last slide, strategic level. So uh, I know very well that SAR countries, SAR as such don't have big money for you to spend. But as you said, the citizen initiative, you said, is it possible for us to create a kind of uh, network of all the educational and research institutions happen, I mean, working in different countries so that you can get this kind of uh, data collected very uh, systematically? Or anything happening in this line? Okay, basically, uh, ours is a uh, SARC agriculture center. So the basic system of working is like SARC is coming under the foreign ministry, uh, Ministry of External Affairs in case of India and uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in different countries. So all the eight countries, they have a SARC wing established within their Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yes. So their direct uh, contact is to the Ministry of uh, agriculture whenever the agriculture related, related issues are coming in the case, case of india they either contact the uh, ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare the, the uh, ministry department itself otherwise they come to department of agricultural research and education where i work generally the sark agriculture center is promoting the networks through national agricultural research systems nars in case of india it is icar so in the case of bangladesh it is barc but uh, when it comes to fisheries or ocean studies, our uh, network is not as strong as the agricultural network. So uh, I am proposing a uh, meet. Uh, I am proposing a regional consultation meeting in which eight uh, SARC nation representatives will be participating because I joined quite recently. I am basically a principal scientist from Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute. I am here on deputation. I joined here last February only. I will be here for three years. Within three years. I have in my mind to establish such set of such such a network uh, connecting all the fisheries and ocean bodies together. So uh, I am in a uh, way to do that. And this citizen science initiative, what I discussed here, we have been practicing this in Wembenar Lake, which is in uh, Cochin area. We have a strong citizen science network established there. There are a lot of amateur networks. People who are interested in uh, bird watching, ornithology, they have their own networks. Philately, they have their networks. Anthropologists, they have their networks. So same way, we have we have to have climate-related citizen science network. And this is one small yeah. initiative which you have taken in Bemina to generate. In one, of, in one of your slides, you are mentioning about the participants. Sir, your voice is not audible. Oh, sorry. Am I audible now? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I yes, yes, yes. uh, uh, think is in one of your uh, slides, you are mentioning about the IIT. Uh, IIT. Uh, in IIT Madras, right? No, okay. no, no. Indian, uh, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology. Pune. Okay, Tropical Meteorology, sorry. So there is a development happening in IIT Mumbai. Sitara has, mm. a, I mean, there are a few scientists and they are working on the bore wells and the open wells of the entire world. And mm -hmm. they are part of the international, international level collaboration also. I mean, mm -hmm. monitoring the open wells and bore wells. Like mm -hmm. this is happening only with the kind of volunteering and other organizations functioning within the different exactly. parts of the countries. Exactly. So like that, if you could be able to create a network, people automatically with a kind of app, 
they can straight away upload the information so that yes. it goes automatic yes. so one, one may as you said that will be a wonderful initiative the other yes. question i have i think nobody has raised their hands since i i thought i can take i take one more question from you also the thing is uh, since you are part of uh, seven countries sark nations and uh, eight, eight. You know, eight countries sorry uh, is there any specific common pockets identified for ecosystem not restoration or kind of thing ecosystem management or protection okay uh, there are a lot of activities happening but uh, basically uh, the problem is like uh, uh, when it comes to sark platform we, we we don't have many uh, we have some countries rather than we don't have we have many countries without coastal areas for example nepal afghanistan bhutan uh, but uh, in sark sark system uh, if a program has to be uh, has to take take off then it has to be vetted by all eight countries so when i come with a marine or ocean related platform in this generally there will be a vetoing from all any country vetoes means that it's a problem like any country saying that it is it's not possible then it's a problem so we have to get consent from all eight member states then only the program can take off now my way of convincing them is like i am telling them that ocean is not only for us ocean is for you also whatever is happening in the ocean it is affecting a terrestrial country like you also so there has to be some way you should associate and we should go ahead with this That's and uh, fisheries is a minor component and people uh, uh, i really feel it i i am very vocal i open all all the meetings but their priority is crop sciences their priority is horticultural sciences their priority is natural resource management uh, then livestock then fisheries and fisheries per se they say marine no 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 fresh water <laughs> so this is how the sarks i am just opening up because uh, this is not a official diplomatic meeting so i can open up so i have this problems in the sark platform but we do definitely have come up with some programs and in which i am trying to incorporate some of the components in all the regional consultation meeting i am trying to put it uh when it happened uh, when the pandemic happened when the sector wise stimulus was projected i was telling about the vulnerability of the coastal areas and how the direct stimulus should go to the fishermen farming community and all those things we are trying to explore so with respect to the ecosystem conservation from probably we have to think on a mechanism in which uh, we have to tell that ecosystems are really affected and uh, it is going to have a far reaching influence for the landlocked member states also but in sar platform uh, possibly for the marine or oceans we don't have a ecosystem restoration project or program sar is having a funding mechanism through uh, sar sustainable development fund which is based at uh, timbo in bhutan they uh, facilitate projects through our center sark agriculture center will not be operating uh, uh, programs which has to be implemented at the field level but we have partners so we will facilitate it and our own agency in the timbu will be funding it so such programs are there sometimes international organizations like ifad or fa will come with such programs and you yourself can uh, apply for such funding or project or activities through our channel you can uh, send it to uh, our organization we will get it vetted through the sar countries and send it to the sar development fund but it's a it's a cumbersome process rather than uh, easier process because the bureaucratic hurdles are more because first i have to convince the foreign services officials so uh, it happens but on, only for priority programs and as on now it's not the priority <laughs> uh, sir Uh, thank you sir uh, thank you sir shatri sir actually sir uh, dr nagaratnam sir is uh, here uh, sir i uh, i want to hear some few words from your side sir yes yes uh, uh, thank you dr inpakandan you grasped that uh, i am actually going to ask something uh, sir very good evening you were uh, uh, presenting very pleasantly and uh, we enjoyed your session sir actually uh that was wonderful uh that uh, your presentation uh, we we definitely enjoyed and i uh, had a one question that uh, about uh, you were saying uh, climate uh, change citizen network or something you had uh, said uh, but uh, there was a disruption in my connection so that i did not be able to hear it uh, uh, can you please explain it uh, further uh, on it sir 
Okay, we have formed a sit. Thanks for the nice words about my presentation. Uh, yes, yes. We uh, we have a citizen science network in which around uh, thirteen colleges in and around the Vembanad Lake, which is uh, in Kochi. Uh, okay. it, it, it's, it's, it's having its presence in um, uh, the, the mid Kerala. Some few districts okay. are covered. So in this Vembanad Lake, we are trying to measure the we, we are trying to really objectively measure the color of the lake water, and along with the color of the lake water, we are trying to measure the turbidity using Seki depth. Seki disk is a small equipment which is a 3D printed paper printed equipment on which we have embedded this color code. And we have developed a mobile application known as Turb Aqua. Turb Aqua. This is available in the Google Play Store. It's developed by Simafari. It's in the Google Play Store. You can install that Turb Aqua in any mobile. And once you measure the ocean color based on the color codes, what we have integrated into the Seki disk, this disk is given to the people. Even we can purchase this from Amazon also. It's available in the Amazon. So okay. if you if you do the measurements, you can send the information to us. And uh, we have given a small turbidity calculator also based on the Seki depth. So we will approximately know what is the turbidity of the water bodies in Atharo. Our main interest in this project was because some of the coastal communities are vulnerable to diseases like cholera. And this cholera is having some relation to the turbidity of the water and the type of uh, community structure of the organisms which are present in the water. We are more interested in extracting the uh, optically sensitive variables present in the water bodies using satellite remote sensing data. So DST, Department of Science and Technology, has given us uh, a project known as Revival, in which we are working on the Vembanad Lake, in which we are trying to extract these optically sensitive variables which are present in the water body. So once we have the satellite remote sensing data, simultaneously we are doing in-situ measurements also. Citizen Science Network is on only one portion. So they will go on adding data to our database. At the same time, we are doing in-situ very delicate sensitive scientific experiments and our interest is to give cholera based uh, predictions on cholera like in case of there is a cholera outbreak which is going to happen in the, among the coastal communities based on the environmental variables we are trying to tell that a particular area is going to get infected with cholera and this citizen science network at large will help in um, giving uh, help us in giving advisories to the people who are really involved in taking the measurements for example the tourist boat operators uh, this lake is famous for houseboats. They want to know which areas are going to be clear, which areas are going to be turbid. So they can give, be given an advisory like that. There are aqua farmers. They are interested in a different mechanism. So we can give advisories like that. So basically, this will form a long-term time series database. So climate scientists are struggling for having such database. So this is one mechanism where this data will help us in validating the satellite remote sensing data. And satellite remote sensing data is available for a span of more than uh, uh, 25 to 30 years as on now. From 1998 onwards, we have a lot of uh, data sets available. By 1980s also, there were coastal zone color scanners, scanners which are not, not so useful for our ADA. But now we have a lot of sensors coming up. And this is going to be one good data set which is going to support the climate scientists, satellite remote sensing data. So that's why we have started this initiative. And now there are 13 colleges and around 250 to 300 students. We have taken uh, some faculty coordinators whom we are interesting the Seki disks, which they are providing to the students. And some stakeholders, we have approached some associations. Through them, we are giving the Seki disks. They are measuring and giving us the inputs. Some problems are there, we go, we help them, we support them. That's how it's operational. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Krishnan, sir. Uh, Nagaratnam, sir, is the chairperson for the Department of Communication in Madhuri Kamaraj University. I think he got some idea from your uh, this program, it seems. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I am happy to associate. Like, uh, the program is still running. I am still part of uh, Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute. Probably after my deputation, I will go back to the institute and still my projects are running. I am still deriving my salary from Simon Farai. <laughs> yes, actually, uh, actually, sir, we have conducted uh, several uh, training programs uh, on climate change for media persons uh, since uh, 2016, uh, mm -hmm. all around uh, Madurai. So that uh, we have been uh, uh, trying to networking them and also connecting expert, experts uh, with uh, uh, journalists so that uh, they can, whenever they come to know the uh, problem or issue or the, they wanted to intervene uh, somewhere, uh, they will get the first-hand information from the experts. 
so but uh, the thing is it is very it is still very difficult uh, yes, but yes. at the same time we have, we are also interested in working and also have been working uh, with the communities also so that whenever we require uh, uh, inputs uh, for journalists uh, we uh, require to intervene with the communities as well as with the journalists we have been working it so that i thought it is interested uh, uh, to have such uh, things in uh, many other uh, places in our country also that's very important also and uh, media has got a big role uh, i really vouch it because uh, just prior to my coming here i was handling the media for media of simfari for 3 years so i feel like it's a very important thing like it it, it brings in lot of visibility for any scientific program generally the scientific institutes live in cocoon they they really don't express it and it, and even though some path breaking technologies are there which is having societal impacts it's not reaching the real people so media fraternity is going to help us in this this activity a lot uh, if you have been following simfari media news for the last few years probably you might have seen, seen like how visible simfari has become and last year we won the best institute award also in india among all 108 institutes in icr so uh, it was it is it's very important and uh, for, for a university like satyabama also you you can you can think of uh, taking the uh, real mileage what uh, media is having it will bring visibility not only to the university system but also the academic findings which are there it will reach to the real people and this net network will uh, enrich the uh, the power of the university so it is very important and i like the idea of taking um, inputs from the specialist to the media so that a problem can be resolved okay or if a problem is there there can be some solutions which the experts in the network can suggest and uh, you can resolve it and working with the communities as you said it's important and uh, more and i think dr shyam is going to tell about it more tomorrow uh, so social commitments of uh, scientific organizations it's it, it's it's never done with we have to we have to have our own social commitments and resolve the problems which are there in the society so society has to be part of it and citizen science network in the coming years are going to be much uh, active in this area because funds are going to be less and we have to have scientific data and generating data from citizen science or uh, crowd science whatever we say it is going to be very important and we we have powerful tools in ict also so this is one mechanism thank you sir thank you sir Vita uh, Koosh participant has raised her hands. Sir, yeah. uh, so I have unmuted her. Yeah, ma'am, you can start. Thank you, sir, for this enlightening uh, speech. It's been very helpful. Uh, I just wanted to ask. Uh, uh, am I clearly audible, sir? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes. Very yes, much, very much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, I just wanted uh, to know the. You have mentioned that there is effect of Enso, Enso uh, in relation to coral bleaching. So yes. I just wanted to know uh, what exactly could be the correlation. Um, okay, yeah. uh, you, usually bleaching occurs because uh, the tolerance limit of the polyps, uh, it, it's uh, the tolerance limit is exceeded. exceeded. Generally, we say that uh, in um, uh, in an environment where twenty five to thirty is the ideal, the uh, existing reefs will have its own uh, its own uh, tolerance limit. For example. In Gulf of Manar, it's different. Gulf of Manar is already a temperature-prone area, so the Gulf of Manar reefs are a little bit prone to temperature. But whereas Andaman reefs or uh, Lakshadweep reefs, they are not having that much high temperature. So when they are living in a temperature between 25 to 30, and if the temperature is exceeding, then bleaching can happen because the polyps, because of the uncomfortable temperature, they go out of the exoskeleton, and the exoskeleton. Uh, remains like that for some time and if the polyps are coming back and uh, settling in the exoskeleton they will grow and if it's not happening it will be following an ecological succession polyps also will die and this dyed polyps will be a nutrient for the uh, phytoplankton to grow and because of this ecological succession the phytoplankton will smother the exoskeleton then the corals will not revive so when el nino is happening el nino is happening in december in uh, south american countries el nino is a phenomenon which is happening in december but because the temperature transfer, it is happening in a lagged fashion. It is through an atmospheric bridging mechanism known as Walker circulation, walking Walker circulation. So this Walker circulation is pumping excess heat to the Northern Indian Ocean. And this lag period is four to six months. 
So four to six months means it is happening in December in uh, uh, Latin American countries. Four months means April. Six months means June. So April to June we will have an excessive heating happening in northern Indian Ocean, which is summer. So already there is some uh, problem with the tolerance of the heat and excess heat is being pumped. It's, it's clearly explained in a paper published by us in uh, Environmental Monitoring and Assessment on El Nino and Differential Bleaching. The first order is leaks. Am I clear? So this is how it is. Happening. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, anyone? Uh, they have raised the. Uh, no, sir. Uh, no. no, sir. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, I have one query, sir. Actually, yes. uh, even uh, yesterday also, Vivekanandan sir said the same thing. Uh, this uh, fish migration due to this SST. Uh, as uh, you uh, given an example of the dial sardine, actually oh, that, uh, is, that is not migration. It is extension of spread. Extension, of, yeah, it, it, uh, maybe uh, extension of spread. So actually, uh, these animals, these particular species, they are uh, they are uh, food habitats. Uh, they particularly depend upon the zooplankton as well as phytoplankton. Yes. Yeah, uh, if the, uh, it means even the uh, the primary producer also moving along with this uh, area, and that is uh, reflected in the primary production and the color code. Okay, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Okay, so uh, generally the fish is following the uh, primary producers. There is no yes. doubt in that because we have ITC said intertropical convergence zone, which is forcing the southwest monsoon in the southwest coast so along with the itc set we have upwelling so a moderate upwelling good rains and uh, silica coming in they will create diet diet is blue excessive upwelling is also not so good so when such a thing is happening the sardines will come to that particular area when itc set is moving irrespective of climate change when intertropical convergence zone is moving you can find a similar pattern of sardine catch happening uh, sardines are first caught along the south, southernmost tips like Trivandrum, Quellum, Alabi, those regions, then slowly it moves to the Malabar zone. So that movement is as per the ITC set in the tropical convergence zone along with the southwest monsoon. When the tropical convergence zone is moving, when the wind is moving, the productivity is changing, the sardine shawl is following it. So that's how it is happening. Now, with respect to the type of uh, changes, what is happening because of the climate? So because of the climate, there are changes in this upwelling, there are changes with respect to the coastal circulation pattern, there are changes with respect to the wind and all those related, uh, related variables. So when these changes are there, these changes are creating a problem in the, in the production system. So the, the advantage for the organisms like sardine is like the northern area is known for uh, better productivity compared to the southern area. Southern area, the productivity is completely controlled by upwelling. Northern area, there is longer productivity, but the problem is like it is uh, having a lengthier food chain sustained ecosystem. Like, for example, it is not the simple uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton, fish based system in the northern ecosystem or northern, northeastern Arabian Sea. For example, Gujarat coast, we have more uh, high predatory organisms like cyanids, gol, koth, dhoma, like, like cyanids are the major uh, fishes which are seen there. They have lengthier food chain. They are carnivorous fishes. So from phytoplankton to zooplankton to small fishes or even something like acetus, like the shrimps and all, then comes the large carnivorous fishes. So lengthier food chains are promoted in northern side. So they have a sustained production, uh, primary production happening there. But probably because of the high-end predators and the type of uh, physical setting there, uh, the physical setting there means the changes. We, we have... Uh, less saline waters towards the south and high saline waters towards the north. So high saline water is required for uh, bringing, up, bringing up the eggs with less buoyancy. For example, sardine, the buoyancy is very good. So high saline waters are not required. But in high saline waters also sardine and eggs will go up. Buoyancy is also there. But if the basic problem is with the primary productivity. But there are high-end predators. So this is, a, this is, this is not a uh, long-term solutions. Uh, the problem on uh, the when the pressure on the high end predators are there, there is a cascading effects on the uh, low trophic level organisms like sardines. So that is naturally happening. 
and uh, earlier there was no targeted fishing happening in the northern waters because sardine was fetching price only in kerala even you know in tamil nadu people were not preferring sardine in the earlier days whatever it is being caught there it is coming to kerala so now with the transportation cold chain mechanisms even when it is caught there people can sell it off in kerala so there is one one reason why there is some exorbitant excessive production what is being supported along with the scientific findings so anthropogenic influence is also adding to it so it's not only the phyto or uh, zooplankton changes but in addition anthropogenic influences which are supporting such studies helping uh, scientists to come come to a conclusion that okay there is a, an extension of spread happening there but definitely there are changes which are indicating that uh, for example i told upwelling is the one which is sustaining sardine in the southwest coast this upwelling is showing a northward extension in addition uh, there is a physical oceanographic phenomenon known as minimum oxygen zone this minimum oxygen zone is happening along the red sea or uh, mediterranean uh, or those areas north extreme areas but now that minimum oxygen zone is expanding and it is seriously coming towards the uh, uh, southwest coast of india or the southern side or eastward tilt of minimum oxygen zone in arabian sea so when such things are happening these physical forces will force the sardines automatically to move up move up move up so that's how it is happening so um, along with that uh, many scientists uh, they hypothesize that there is migration now what we are saying is extension of spread but there is migration also happening many people are hypothesizing that but we don't have proper tagged experiments to support it but catch that uh, clearly indicate that when there is less sardine happening in kerala there is some increase happening in tamil nadu so there is some sort of pattern which we can see but it is not clearly supporting the migration unless and until it is proved by some tag experiments so simofar may be doing it in the near future we are doing it for large species but small species also we have to do it like sardine to clearly establish whether it's migrating now it is extension of spread uh, so one more question uh, is it uh, as uh, i have seen the papers uh, for the sardine relocation Uh, the same way is this primary production relocation is has been already uh, reported or still have to be mapped or uh, it have to be studied oh i i i have some some papers uh, roxy has uh, done some uh, studies and uh, he is clearly telling how the primary productivity is changing all along the north of indian ocean uh, it, it's all based on uh, like zones like how much is the, and there are papers also even from simofar also i if you are interested i can send some papers primary please, sir, please, is changing please, please, it is yeah. changing it is changing there are good papers thank you sir thanks a lot sir i know is it any other people raise their hands or they have send the questions in the chat box no sir no sir okay. if okay. they are hesitant to ask me they can even mail me i'll yes sir yes sir uh, if i am if I, if i am not answering again send the mail yeah, yes sir I, even uh, we will uh, circulate your email to all the people sir yes sir we will circulate thank in our whatsapp group Thank you, sir. Thanks, uh, thanks for the wonderful and informative presentation, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank sir. you so much, sir. Thank you for Thank your wonderful. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Anu, please carry on. Yes, sir. So, regarding uh, tomorrow's session, it will be handled by Dr. Sham Salim on topic reducing economic cost of adaptation. Principal scientist of Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute. So, kindly join the session at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you sir good night sir okay. thank bye you bye 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 thank you thank you all